Welcome back to the Home of Human Rights Conference and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a long day but it's been really uh, inspiring I think to hear so much about particularly from Finland how they're setting out a plan to actually eradicate homelessness by 2027. I think it's something that has really given us something to aspire to and show that it's possible um, and we also saw some really interesting talks about the links between housing and health, I think, was really, really interesting. Um, I'm delighted to be joined now by from Sweden for, by Friedrich Gerten, who is the director of the award winning documentary Push, which we're going to show at half seven. Um, and I'm really delighted. I've, I've talked to Friedrich on his podcast, uh, Pushback and Pushback Talks. You give me the right name again, Friedrich. Let's let's really put it out there. Pushback Talks. That's it. I knew I, I thought I had it. Pushback Talks. Um, and we uh, also put it out on my own podcast, Reboot Republic. Um, and it was a great chat. And I have to say, I've seen the documentary and I think it's really excellent. Um, maybe you could explain to us, Friedrich, a little bit about, you know, where what was your idea behind doing it and how did you actually fund it? Because I think it was a crowdsourced uh, project, if I'm right. But maybe you could explain just a little bit about that. Well, well, my job is to be a filmmaker, <laughs> so I do films, and 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 I'm 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 kind of a curious guy, so I I, I put myself some questions, and I, what, the main question for this product was, why are our homes getting more and more expensive all over the world? Not only renting, also buying homes. It's like it's it's kind of gone out of the hand and it's it's a global thing so i i was i went out to look for the global pattern what is the global pattern that is going on and um, so of course i've been researching a lot and and uh, i understood that this like this is something that the most powerful do <laughs> uh, and it's their effect on our lives and and then when i found um, leilani farah the then UN Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing. Uh, I had kind of found my, my private detective that could go out and, and look for the, for the truth or what's cooking. And so I, I worked with her for a few years and we traveled the world. And, um, and I think doing the film, I understood more and more. So, I mean, for, the film is named Push and this is something I've heard the word push coming from many different countries, the feeling of being pushed out of your community, of your neighbor, neighborhood, from your city. So this is something, an, a feeling that people have around the world. Um, and of course, this word financialization, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even know this before. And I, I had hard problem to pronounce it, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but it explains something because people have been talking about gentrification a lot. And when you talk about gentrification, you have a gentrifier. And the gentrifier sometimes is a hipster who makes good coffee or who bakes nice breads. And then you don't like him because he he's the, or she is the reason that the neighbors are changing. I think that's uh, that kind of blaming uh, small entrepreneurs. It's it's very stupid and has nothing to do with the re the reality. And in the film, you will hear that Saskia Sassen, the the amazing uh, sociologist, she says that this is much deeper than gentrification. It, I mean, if it was the gentrification, it was something easy. This is something much, much more aggressive. And um, you will see the film and you will you will feel it. I mean, but um, as I we talked about this, we, this, this podcast I do together with Leilani Farah, we call it Pushback Talks, where we kind of deepen and update stories from the film. And this week's episode is actually from Berlin. 
And Berlin is like also like Dublin, a city that has been attracting a lot of capital. So it's basically a bunch of billionaires that has taken over the city. And suddenly they they pay too much for these homes, for these houses. The, the, really, rents, the rents have gone up. Yes, I mean, but first the, the rents didn't go up straight off. They just put money on these houses. And now, but of course, now they want to, to get the money back. So then they need to put up the rents. So it basically, people with too much money, they don't know where to place them and place them in, in our homes. And suddenly our homes go crazy. It, it, it becomes very, very expensive. But it, it, it's showing, isn't it, that there's something different about what's happening right now than, you know, like we even think of, you know, like Donald Trump, you know, he's a real estate investor, you know, and we think, you know, in the 1980s, you had this emergence of these, you know, real estate entrepreneurs and we're buying up properties, developing offices, you know, we've even, you know, historically, we've had private builders and developers, financiers, mm -hmm. you know, building housing, but there is something different about this global wealth funds, these real estate funds, but, isn't it? And, and what do you think is the real the difference? The big difference is the energy. The energy is extreme. They're moving so quick and they have access to all the money they need. So, I, I mean, it's, that's why, I mean, Blackstone, the biggest uh, private equity fund, they suddenly became the biggest private owner of Swedish social housing. And then three, four years later, they sold everything. They, they became the biggest owners of this, the same shit in, in, uh, in the Czech Republic. And then suddenly they sold everything. So it's like, it's, and then we talk about 40, 50,000 units and they, they, it's go quick, quick, quick. And, it's, and, and then as these guys, they don't, they're not so creative. So, so other companies, they, they just copy these behaviors. So everybody with money knows that uh, if you can find a, a building in a city where there is a big need of renovation, a big need of renovation means that you can push the value up. So they're, they're looking, they're actually mostly, before you talked about, you know, you buying shopping malls or bank buildings or hotels or something like mm. that. But now it's even more rentable to look for poor people's homes poor people's homes is actually the best business. And that makes it very cynical because uh, our salaries has not risen at all over the last 10 years, but the, the price, the cost of living has risen a lot. So, so this is creating a crisis all over the world. And I mean, you know it in Ireland, but I mean, you, you can go anywhere. You can go to Lagos, Nigeria. You can go to Santiago de Chile. You can go to uh, Ho Chi Minh City or to Bangkok or to, I mean, and, and this film that you're about to see has been shown um, at, in at least 80 countries and, and it creates a local debate everywhere. So this, the pattern you will see in this film is a global pattern. And the stress you feel in Dublin or where you live is the same stress people and tenants and, and people feel in other cities around the world. I think that's kind of interesting that this is something we are facing together. The result of, of, uh, of this, this huge, vast amount of money that is looking for, for a place to park itself. It's, and it's, you know, before, a landlord was building a house, it was like planting a forest. That's how you saw about building a, building a house. It was a long-term investment. But now the housing market is bringing in people from the finance world. They are they, they, they're never into long-term investments. It's all about quick turnovers. And, and, the, and many of these purchases of buildings are made by real, real estate investment trusts or different kind of financial products. So the people who, who might own your building don't even know the name of your city. So this, it's, the distance is so huge. And, and you can see now many housing companies, the information on their web pages are not information towards tenants, it's information towards investors. So, I mean, it's, it's a different game.
they, mm. they the client of a of a of a building is not the tenant it's the investor so you, it's incredible because like we're seeing it right now in dublin um literally right as we're, we're talking the last few days we have seen you know blocks of apartments you know hundreds of units in a, in a new development being bought up by a german pension fund being bought up by you know global and you know we've since and, and we've talked about it you know we've land banks huge banks of land around dublin owned by us you know vulture funds who bought them a couple of years ago um a lot of this whole plans of we have a problem as well that they're developing and our planning system has, has facilitated this is micro living units called co-living and um, which are these tiny units it's like these push for these smaller units to actually build that the, the new are you seeing this as well or you know around the it's, world yeah it happens everywhere and also many of these companies building these um, small apartments they're also then real real estate investment trusts so they're in, in it, they're also a part of some kind of financial instrument. So it's again not the need of people. It's something else that is behind the driving force is behind a lot of things that are happening on the housing market. So it's housing as a human good, housing as a, a place to, to live and build a family is it's not in the center of their business model. Their business model is to push up values. They're looking for undervaluated assets. And now it happens to be our homes. But before an undervaluated asset could be <clears throat> a piece of land or a, a gold mine or a factory or something, or a, you know, a business, but now it's actually our homes. <clears throat> Sorry. No, it, it, I think it, it, it's fundamental. And there's a couple of things that because <coughs> in here, we have our government making the case that you know, this is good. This is new supply and we have a housing shortage problem. So at least these investors bring supply. What would you say to that? Um, I mean, when you talk about a housing crisis, um, there, it's, it's not always true. There is a lot of homes. There's a lot of, I mean, built places, but a lot of them stand empty. So it's, and it, or they're priced too high. So there's not always a lack of apartments to live in it's a lack of affordable places to live in and the thing is with these huge investments happening now they're taking off more and more affordable homes from the market mm. so it becomes very hard so i mean in the, this film had its world premiere in copenhagen and it was kind of a lucky situation because blackstone had just bought a lot of buildings in copenhagen and created a big crisis and to our screen is a lot of Blackstone tenants came and they were really angry. And at one of the, the, the debates after the film, there was a then housing minister, but also a lot of other politicians. And when the, the housing minister said, oh yeah, yeah, this is a problem that happens maybe in London or New York, but not Copenhagen. Then the half of the audience were just standing up and shouting. And that minister who lost the election and the new minister uh, now is social democrat he they they actually managed to pull the legislation through the the parliament and now denmark has a, a lex blackstone a blackstone law which is basically a, a rent cap for five years and it's a way of kind of cooling down the market making it less interesting for people who want to to turn around in a very short time. Berlin has also had this kind of uh, rent cap that you might have heard this Friday, uh, last week, uh, this rent cap was challenging in uh, the constitutional court and the tenants lost, which is now creating a huge crisis in Berlin. But it also makes this, the housing crisis now into a national debate and it, it's election in, in Germany coming up now in September. So this is, will be a big issue. And there's actually now a campaign in Berlin where they want to, uh, to um, expropriate one of the biggest housing companies, a company that has 340,000 apartments in Berlin. And so this is something that will, there will be, people will be voting on expropriation. And, and, um, and they also want 
not only to pay the price that it's today, they want to pay the price that were, they were 10 years ago. Because they, the reason they say that all this money that's been put on top of our homes is speculative money. And we, the city can't buy to that, to that high price because then we can't deliver to, to the needs to the people. So this is in Germany. It's, it's kind of interesting. I think we should all I, I think what's going on. It's, it's radical, and it, but it's interesting. It is very interesting for us because I think, you know, as I said, we're, we're in the middle of being, you know, we've, as I explained, we've been financialized, but we're right in the middle of this battle, as, as I've put it, you know, that, uh, you know, the battle for the, the future of our housing system. And of course, a big question is, you know, once these investors come in, as they are doing, can we change that? And so really, if, if I'm right, could I ask you about the rent cap specifically? Is that a rent, like you can't increase rent at all for five years or does it set a certain percentage? Because we had a rent cap here, which said you can only increase it by 4% a year. So, which was essentially, we believe that it was done for the investors because that's roughly what they want to get a return. I, I'm, you know, I'm basically a filmmaker, so I'm not an expert on housing. Uh, so I, I mean, uh, you are now. You are. Now. I don't want to go into those details. I don't think. I mean, in Berlin, actually, the rents got lowered a lot. Some, mm. some apartments up to four hundred euros a month. Mm. Now landlords want them to pay back tenants to pay back for one and a half years of lower rent. So some guys, some people will get a bill of 5,000 euros this week. Mm. So you can imagine the, uh, the crisis or people are living in apartments they can't afford any longer because the rent will suddenly go up 400 euros overnight. So this is, and in Berlin, it's a city where the majority lives in rented apartments. So it's not only the poor people are affected here. It's like everybody. Mm -hmm. which makes it, which also makes it interesting because in many cities there's a separation of, of the people who are well off and the ah, it's not for me, I'm getting richer, my house is more worth now than before, which is of course is silly because uh, the, the, I mean, the, the middle class who own their own apartments, they, they have a feeling that they are sitting safe, but we also know that if the system is shaking in some way, they will shake also. Yeah. And, yeah. and a much bigger part of their homes are now owned by the financial institutions. So it's also their homes are a part of the, the takeover of our cities from the financial market. The financial market is owning our homes in a much bigger percentage than ever in, in human history. And that's profound. And, and I'm interested in terms of and when you said uh, you're a filmmaker um, to explore a little bit of that, that how did you or do you think, you know, we tell this story in a way that connects with people, you know, and how, how did you think about that? And, you know, maybe you could provide us because, you know, we're policy people and activists and, you know, we're not storytellers naturally, but it's clearly something that, you know, you successfully do in this film, you tell you know, a story and a narrative and it's gripping. Mm. How do you do that? And what do you, you know, what are those kind of stories you think we should try to tell from now to try and, you know, engage people? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, my challenge was, that, which, which I said, was to, to, to see if we can see the global pattern, it's easier to talk about it because housing politics, you can hear the very word is extremely boring. <laughs> so, uh, and it's very technical. It's very dropping from old histories and those old systems. So I, I try to take away all that and, and then you can see a, the, the pattern clearer. And I can tell you, I mean, I mean we showed a film uh, at the big Castro Theater in San Francisco, sold out. And uh, San Francisco is one of those cities that has gone totally wild. It's, it's so expensive. People pay uh, $4,800 for a two bedroom. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's insane uh, a month. But a young woman came up, up to me after the screening and said, Frederick, I feel less lonely now when I've seen this film. Mm -hmm. Because now I understand it's not my fault. I, 
I've, I've been believing that it was me that wasn't smart enough for this system, for this city. I didn't buy in time. I didn't move at the right moment. You know, it's, it's this kind of, the idea is that you have to be smart. You know, pe smart people can make it and the stupid people, they are, they're, I mean, so people go walk around and feel stupid mm -hmm. uh, because they, are, they have a shitty housing situation. And we should understand that this is actually a systematic problem. It's a, it's the, it's the takeover of our homes. Uh, and I mean, most countries, social democratic like ours, or I mean, of that kind of tradition, but many others have also have had um, some kind of housing policy. You would like you the, the governments have wanted to have work the working class or the middle class should have their homes because that's a part of uh, of the societal uh, infrastructure you know it's like building roads yeah we need roads uh, we need but we also need uh, homes mm. and it's it, it was, and it was never meant to be like um, machines to produce a lot of wealth so it it was like planting a forest. It was a long-term investment where you, of course you can own it. It was good for your family if you had a house, but, or if you were owning a house. But now it's the, the, the logic of the financial circus is that they don't really care where the money grows. They're looking all the time for this undervaluated assets and it can be anything. And, and the people, and when I mean, I guess you have a pension savings, and they could also be invested into Blackstone or whatever. Mm. So it's it's almost like it's our own savings that are destroying our own lives because it's not only it's not only our homes; it's also the the fabric of society. It's the the, the bars, the the coffee shops, the the, the old shops. Rents go up for them too. So also the small businessman is under a lot of pressure. I mean, it's hard to have a bookshop. It's almost impossible to have a cinema, you know, because it's it's not rentable enough for these new these new landlords. So this is so it's it's creating there's a lot of devastation in in the footsteps of uh, financialization. Mm. And then the chains are moving in, which is also then money that is, I mean. When you, if your home is owned by a, a vulture fund, all that extra money you pay is not going back to your own city. It just, it just leaves the country. And if you're, if you buy your coffee at Starbucks, part of, part of that money will just go out. Instead of you, if you support a, a local coffee shop, the money will circulate in 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 the community. So it's. I mean, overall, I mean, we have the, this kind of measure of GDP and, and the GDP is doing fine, but if, there's nothing to do with production if, if my rent goes up and if all the money just leaves the country, how, how can that be good? So yeah. it, also that measure is like, it's losing its, its meaning. So what, from what you're seeing, what, what do you think can be done? I think what you are doing Rory and your your group is the the thing. I mean, it's it's very much about mapping, understanding who are the owners of your city. That's what they're doing in Berlin very well. But I think there's a big European uh, initiative now to, to try to map the owners. I think if we can understand that the owners are some are different than they were ten years ago. Remember Blackstone, the biggest landlord on the planet right now. They didn't own a single. Uh, rental house uh, until 2012. So it, we're talking about eight, nine years. You know, it's a very short time in history. So it's a, a yeah. new global landlord, but that new global landlord is also in your neighborhood. And if we can see that, it's it's easier to talk about it. But then, of course, the, the big answer must be politics. It must be the, I mean, the national politics, the national governments need to step up and, and, um, and they can, they can, they will only do that if, if we put pressure on them. 
But I think the what we do with this, with our podcast, the Pushback Talks, is that we try to bring in voices from around the world uh, and experiences of pushing back, because there are a lot of people pushing back. You can look at uh, Barcelona in Spain, for example. There's a lot of very interesting things uh, taking place, but you will see this popping up around the globe. I would say. Mm. So to, just to finish up, maybe. Do you feel, how do you feel now after making, if you were making the, the documentary again now, what would you add to it or would you change anything? <laughs> I don't, I don't remake my films. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then in part two, what will you put in part two? In the sequel? Well, there is a lot more to understand, of course. Um, it's overall, I would say, I mean, we are brought up, all of us, with some kind of understanding that there is a social contract. That if we, if we study, we work hard, we teach our children to be good, to be kind, to be responsible, we pay our taxes, you know, we try to be good citizens. And then we find out, and this is a global experience, that the ones who are taking home the game are the, are the rule breakers. The rule breakers are the ones winning the game. The people who don't want to pay taxes, uh, the tax havens, the, I mean, it's, it's the whole is that, and, the, and we know the tax havens is also where, where the illegal capitalism and the legal capitalism meet and merge. So it's like, it's, it's this big machine of money laundering and tax evasion, golden visas and so on, but it's also infecting our societies. I mean, do you know how much criminal money is in your city buying homes? No, we don't know. Nobody knows. But there's a lot of it. And I'd say it's not just in our city. It's a, no. We do a great amount of facilitation of those illegal and flows of capital. No, but, but the thing is, when, when money is laundered, it's just, it's just money. So mm -hmm. it's but so because... I mean, now during COVID, we haven't been able to travel, but the money is traveling full speed, you know, super mm -hmm. size. You know, it's like, it's so quick. So it's, it's uh, we've had 40 years of deregulations and I think it's time to close that door. We need to, politics need to be in control again because this beast has been running too wild and that's, and I think politicians know that, but they don't really know how to, to put it back again. It's too powerful now. And the governments are less powerful than before. But they, so they need to, to gain force again, I think. Governments need to take back their power and control, start yeah. controlling finance and capital again. Yeah. It's a big, that's a complete shift away from the dominant neoliberal hegemonic order that we've had for the last 40 years yeah but and i it i think i mean you, you can even see now the new finance minister of the u.s speaking out it's like they are they, they understand it this, this is like it's it's too much but of course it's it will be very hard to move it because they are also the people with most money they also invest most money into into buying political agenda and you know to in you know into lobbying and so on so it, it, every little fight will be very hard to take so but i think people understand it but they don't really know how to move it mm. and that's the importance then as you say of the pushback yeah. of people actually getting organized and tenants getting organized and every little battle every little bit somebody does yeah. will make the change but it's also i mean you, in the film, you want to meet Leilani Farah, and she, she has a very clear language. She says that housing is a human right. And I think only by, you know, we've heard for years now that housing market, you know, it's mm. like it's been always something connected with market all the time. Mm. If, if we instead say housing is a human right, and you can actually hear that more and more uh, people around the world are using that expression. It's, it's, it is, it's a game changer to actually point out that there is 
uh, international human rights legislation that every government has have signed on to. So it's actually they they need to meet that, and and I think that's also a game changer. So fighting back, you do that with knowledge, which you are providing with your work, Rory, but also the film is providing knowledge. Uh, we fight back with knowledge, and then we fight back with with our own language. And we have to fight their language because their language is constructed to create explanation models why we need to follow in their what they suggest. So they are they are investing a lot of money into explanation models. We need to to fight that language and create our own language. So and with that we can also change the political agenda. That's that's how I see it. That's great. Frederick, I really appreciate you taking the time um, to chat to us this evening about uh, that. And I have to say, you, there's no doubt you are a housing expert now, as well as a filmmaker. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think you're so right about that language. And it's something, you know, I've talked to the ideas of, you know, reclaiming housing as a human right. Home, those ideas of home, that that's what housing should provide, of community, of, you know, health. Um, no, I think it's, uh, hopefully we are, you know, at that point where we're going to push back and uh, make that change, so. And to the audience out there, if you if you like the film, you can you can also tweet to me. My name is under here, Frederick Gerton, and you can tweet to push the film and, um, or Instagram or Facebook, whatever. I mean, if you have more questions, you're welcome. And it's also good if you use your social media to talk about the film and the issues, because that is also, a way of, of spreading the knowledge. And of course, our, post, our podcast needs more listeners on Ireland. Mm. <laughs> Great, yeah, no, we encourage people to, to do that. So the, we're, the hashtag we're using this evening is home, a human right. And you can do, talk about the movie, talk about what you're seeing in it. And it's, it's at, at push, isn't it? At push the film is the Twitter handle. Uh, it's push under score. underscore. Uh, the film, yeah. Yeah, push underscore the film, that's it. And Friedrich Gerton, yeah, absolutely. Listen, Friedrich, thanks so much. And do you want to introduce the, the, your documentary now? I just say lean back and, uh, and if you're at home, I guess you're at home, you, you should maybe a little beer or something, glass of wine and um, enjoy, it's a film. Thank you so much. <laughs>